If we are thinking about the effect of education, or the lack of it on our nature, there's another comparison we can make. Picture human beings living in some sort of underground cave dwelling, with an entrance which is long, as wide as the cave, and open to the light. Here they live from earliest childhood, with their legs and necks in chains, so that they have to stay where they are, looking only ahead of them, prevented by the chains from turning their heads. They have light from a distant fire, which is burning behind them and above them. Between the fire and the prisoners, at a higher level than them, is a path along which you must picture a low wall that has been built, like the screen which hides people when they're giving a puppet show and above which they make the puppets appear. Yes, I can picture all that, he said. Picture also, along the length of the wall, people carrying all sorts of manufactured objects which project above it, statues of people, animals made of stone and wood and all kinds of materials. As you'd expect, some of the people carrying the objects are speaking while others are silent. A strange picture and strange prisoners. No more strange than us, I said. Do you think for a start that prisoners of that sort have ever seen anything more of themselves and of one another than the shadows cast by the fire on the wall of the cave in front of them? How could they, if they'd been prevented from moving their heads all their lives? What about the objects which are being carried? Wouldn't they see only shadows of these also? Yes, of course. So, if they were able to talk to one another, don't you think they'd believe that the things they were giving names to were the things they could see passing? Yes, they'd be bound to. What if the prison had an echo from the wall in front of them? Every time one of the people passing by spoke, do you suppose they'd believe the source of the sound to be anything other than the passing shadow? No, that's exactly what they would think. All in all, then, what people in this situation would take for truth would be nothing more than the shadows of the manufactured objects. Necessarily. Suppose nature brought this state of affairs to an end, I said. Think what their release from their chains and the cure for their ignorance would be like. When one of them was untied and compelled suddenly to stand up, turn his head, start walking and look towards the light, he'd find all these things painful. Because of the glare, he'd be unable to see things whose shadows he used to see before. What do you suppose he'd say if he was told that what he used to see before was of no importance, whereas now his eyesight was better since he was closer to what is and looking at things which more truly are? Suppose further that each of the passing objects was pointed out to him and that he was asked what it was and compelled to answer. Don't you think he'd be confused? Wouldn't he believe the things he saw before to be more true than what was being pointed out to him now? Yes, he would. Much more true. If he was forced to look at the light itself, wouldn't it hurt his eyes? Wouldn't he turn away and run back to the things he could see? Wouldn't he think those things really were clearer than what was being pointed out? Yes, he said. And if he was dragged out of there by force, up the steep and difficult path, with no pause until he'd been dragged right into the sunlight, wouldn't he find this dragging painful? Wouldn't he resent it? And when he came into the light, with his eyes filled with the glare, would he be able to see a single one of the things people call real? No, he wouldn't. Not at first. He'd need to acclimatise himself, I imagine, if he were going to see things up there, to start with, he'd find shadows the easiest things to look at. After that, reflections of people and other things in water. The things themselves would come later, and from those he would move on to the heavenly bodies and the heavens themselves. He'd find it easier to look at the light of the stars and the moon by night than look at the sun and the light of the sun by day. Of course. The last thing he'd be able to look at, presumably, would be the sun. Not its image in water or some location that is not its own, but the sun itself. He'd be able to look at it by itself, in its own place, and see it as it really was. Yes, 
he said, that would unquestionably be the last thing he'd be able to look at. At that point he would work out that it was the sun which caused the seasons and the years, which governed everything in the visible realm, and which was, in one way or another, responsible for everything they used to see. That would obviously be the next stage. Now, suppose he were reminded of the place where he lived originally, of what passed for wisdom there, and of his former fellow prisoners. Don't you think he would congratulate himself on the change? Wouldn't he feel sorry for them? Indeed he would. Back in the cave they might have had rewards and praises and prizes for the person who was quickest at identifying the passing shapes, who had the best memory for the ones which came earlier or later or simultaneously, and who, as a result, was best at predicting what was going to come next. Do you think he would feel any desire for these prizes? Would he envy those who were respected and powerful there? Or would he feel as Achilles does in Homer? Would he much prefer to labour as a common serf, serving a man with nothing to his name, putting up with anything to avoid holding those opinions and living that life. Yes, he said, if you ask me, he'd be prepared to put up with anything to avoid that way of life. There's another question I'd like to ask you, I said. Suppose someone like that came back down into the cave and took up his old seat. Wouldn't he find, coming straight in from the sunlight, that his eyes were swamped by the darkness? I'm sure he would. And suppose he had to go back to distinguishing the shadows in competition with those who had never stopped being prisoners. Before his eyes had grown accustomed to the dark, while he still couldn't see properly, and this period of acclimatization would be anything but short, wouldn't he be a laughing-stock? Wouldn't it be said of him that he'd come back from his journey to the upper world with his eyesight destroyed, and that it wasn't worth even trying to go up there? As for anyone who tried to set them free and take them up there, if they could somehow get their hands on him and kill him, wouldn't they do just that? They certainly would, he said. That is the picture then, my dear Glaucon, and it fits what we were talking about earlier in its entirety. The region revealed to us by sight is the prison dwelling, and the light of the fire inside the dwelling is the power of the sun. If you identify the upward path and the view of things above with the ascent of the soul to the realm of understanding, then you will have caught my drift, my surmise, which is what you wanted to hear. Whether it is really true, perhaps only God knows. My own view, for what it's worth, is that in the realm of what can be known, the thing seen last, and seen with great difficulty, is the form or character of the good. But when it is seen, the conclusion must be that it turns out to be the cause of all that is right and good for everything. In the realm of sight, it produces light, and light's sovereign, the sun, while in the realm of thought, it is itself sovereign, producing truth and reason unassisted. I further believe that anyone who is going to act wisely, either in private life or in public life, must have had a sight of this form of the good. Well, I for one agree with you, he said, as far as I can follow, at any rate. Can you agree with me, then, on one further point? It's no wonder if those who have been to the upper world refuse to take an interest in everyday affairs, if their souls are constantly eager to spend their time in that upper region. It's what you'd expect, presumably, if things really are like the picture we've just drawn. Yes, it's what you'd expect. And here's another question. Do you think it's at all surprising if a person who turns to everyday life, after the contemplation of the divine, cuts a sorry figure, and makes a complete fool of himself, if before he can see properly, or can get acclimatised to the darkness around him, he is compelled to compete in the law courts or anywhere else about the shadows of justice, or the statues which cast those shadows, or to argue about the way they are understood by those who have never seen justice itself. No, it's not in the least surprising, he said. Anyone with any sense, I said, would remember that people's eyesight can be impaired in two quite different ways, and for two quite different reasons. There's the change from light to darkness, and the change from darkness to light. He might then take it that the same is true of the soul, 
so that when he saw a soul in difficulties, unable to see, he would not laugh mindlessly, but would ask whether it had come from some brighter life and could not cope with the unfamiliar darkness, or whether it had come from greater ignorance into what was brighter and was now dazzled by the glare. One he would congratulate on what it had seen and on its way of life, the other he would pity, or if he chose to laugh at it, his laughter would be less absurd than laughter directed at the soul which had come from the light above. Yes, what you say is entirely reasonable. Well, I said, if it's true, there's one conclusion we can't avoid. Education is not what some people proclaim it to be. What they say, roughly speaking, is that they are able to put knowledge into souls where none was before, like putting sight into eyes which were blind. Yes, that is what they say. Whereas our present account indicates that this capacity in every soul, this instrument by means of which each person learns, is like an eye which can only be turned away from the darkness and towards the light by turning the whole body. The entire soul has to turn with it, away from what is coming to be, until it is able to bear the sight of what is, and in particular the brightest part of it. This is the part we call the good, isn't it? Yes. It is up to us, then, as founders of the city, to compel the best natures to get as far as that study which we said earlier was the most important, to make that ascent and view the good. And when they have made it and seen all they need to see, we must not allow them to do what they are allowed to do at the moment. What is that? Remain there, I said and refused to come back down again to the prisoners we were talking about, or share in their hardships and rewards, be they trivial or substantial. That seems very unfair. Are we going to make them live a worse life when it is in their power to live a better one? Now it's your turn to have forgotten, my friend, that the law does not exist for the exclusive benefit of one class in the city. Its aim is to engineer the benefit of the city as a whole, using persuasion and compulsion to bring the citizens into harmony and making each class share with the other classes the contribution it is able to bring to the community. The law is what puts people like this in the city, and it does so not with the intention of allowing each of them to go his own way, but so that it can make use of them for its own purposes, to bind the city together. True, he said, I had forgotten that. In which case, Glaucon, you should bear in mind that we won't after all be doing an injustice to those who become philosophers in our city. There will be justice in what we say to them when we compel them to look after and guard what belongs to other people. It is fair enough, we shall say to them, for philosophers in other cities not to take a share of the work in those cities. Their philosophy is a spontaneous growth which arises despite the institutions of the particular city they live in, and what has developed naturally, indebted to nobody for its upbringing, is entitled to be unenthusiastic about paying anyone for its upbringing. But with you, it's different. We produced you as guides and rulers, both to yourselves and to the rest of the city, like leaders or kings in a hive of bees. You have been better and more fully educated than the rest, and are better able to play your part in both types of life, so you must go down, each of you in turn, to join the others in their dwelling place. You must get used to seeing in the dark, and when you do get used to it, you will see a thousand times better than the people there do. You will be able to identify all the images there, and know what they are images of, since you have seen the truth of what is beautiful and just and good. In this way, the government of the city, for us and for you, will be a waking reality rather than the kind of dream in which most cities exist nowadays, governed by people fighting one another over shadows and quarrelling with one another about ruling, as if ruling were some great good. The truth is, I imagine, that the city in which those who are to rule are most reluctant to do so will inevitably be the city which has the best and most stable government, whereas the city with rulers of the opposite kind will have a government of the opposite kind. Exactly, he said. Will they disobey us then, do you think, 
these people we have brought up? Will they refuse to do their share of work in the city, each group in its turn, even though they can still spend most of their time in each other's company in the clear air above? They can't possibly refuse. It's a just demand, and they are just people. But they will undoubtedly approach ruling each one of them as something unavoidable, just the opposite of the people who rule in every city at the moment. That's right, my friend. It's like this. If you can find a better life than ruling for the people who are going to be your rulers, then your well-governed city becomes a possibility. It will be the only city ruled by those who are truly rich, not rich in money, but in a good and wise life. The rich is needed for good fortune. If you get beggars, people who are starved of good things in their own lives, going into public life because they believe that the good is something to be taken from there as plunder, then your city is not a possibility. Ruling becomes something to be fought over, and a war of this kind, domestic and internal, destroys both those involved in it and the rest of the city with them. Very true, he said. All right, then. Can you think of any life apart from the life of true philosophy which has a contempt for public office? Good heavens, no. But ruling must be courted only by those who are not in love with her. Otherwise, they will have rival suitors to contend with. Of course. And if you're going to compel people to enter upon the guardianship of the city, who better than those who are wisest in these matters, in what will give the city the best government, and who have their own rewards and their own way of life better than the political? There is no one better he said. Very well, Glaucon. The agreed characteristics of the city which is to reach the peak of political organisation are community of women, community of children and the whole system of education, community likewise of everyday life, both in wartime and peacetime, and the kingship of those among them who have developed into the best philosophers and the best when it comes to war. Yes, he said. Those are the agreed characteristics. What is more, we also agreed that when the rulers assume power, they will take the soldiers and move them to housing of the kind we described earlier, common to all of them, and offering no private property to anyone. And in addition to the nature of their housing, we even reached agreement, if you recall, on the kind of possessions they will have. I do recall... We thought that none of them should have any of the possessions which most people nowadays have. They should be guardians and warrior athletes of some sort, receiving from the rest of the citizens, as annual pay for their guardianship, just as much maintenance as they need for this purpose. Their duty would be to protect themselves and the rest of the city. You're right, I said. But after we'd finished dealing with all that... Can we remember the point where we began this digression, so that we can carry on from the same place? That's easy enough, he said. You were talking in pretty much the way you're talking now, as if you had completed your account of the city. You were saying you regarded the kind of city you had just described, and the individual who resembled it, as a good one, despite the fact that you apparently had an even better city and individual to tell us about. You certainly said that if this was the right sort of city, then the others must have something wrong with them. And you said, if I remember rightly, that there were four other kinds of regime, or four others worthy of discussion at any rate. You said we should look at their faults and at the individuals who resemble them, so that when we had examined all the individuals and reached agreement on which was the best and which was the worst, we could ask whether the best individual is the happiest and the worst the most wretched, or whether that's all a mistake. I asked you which four regimes you meant, but then Polymarchus and Adamantus interrupted, and that started you on the discussion which has brought you here. What an excellent memory. In that case, try and give me the answer you were going to give me then. Certainly, I said, assuming I can, that is. Apart from anything else, I have reasons of my own for wanting to know which four regimes you meant. There will be no difficulty in telling you that. They even have names, the ones I'm talking about. There's the one which is pretty generally approved, the Cretan or Spartan. Next, and next in the scale of general approval, is the one called oligarchy, 
a form of government filled with all sorts of evils. In contrast to oligarchy and the form of government which in turn arises out of it is democracy. And then there is the wonderful institution of tyranny, standing head and shoulders above all the others, the fourth and last diseased state of the city. Can you think of any other kind of regime which forms a distinct category of its own? I take it that hereditary rule by families, kingships which go to the highest bidder, and other similar regimes, which you will find are no less common among the barbarians than among the Greeks, are all intermediate between the forms I have mentioned. Yes, he said, we certainly do hear about plenty of extraordinary regimes. Well then, are you aware that for individuals also there must necessarily be as many kinds of character as there are kinds of regime? Or do you think that regimes somehow come into being from oak or stone? Isn't it rather from the characters of people in the city which tip the scale, as it were, taking the rest with them? No, I think it's entirely the character of the inhabitants. In which case, if there are five types of city, then for individuals there will likewise be five dispositions of the soul. Of course. Well, we have finished describing the person who resembles aristocracy, and we say quite rightly that he is good and just. Yes, we have described him. Is the next thing, then, to describe the ones who are less good, the lover of victory and honour, who corresponds to the Spartan regime, and then in turn the oligarchic character, the democratic, and the tyrannical? That way we can contrast the most unjust, when we find him, with the most just. Our investigation into how pure justice fares, relative to pure injustice, in terms of the happiness or wretchedness of the person who possesses it, will be complete. And we can either follow Thrasymachus's advice and pursue injustice, or follow the argument which is unfolding before us now and pursue justice. Yes, he said, that's exactly what we have to do. All right, then. Shall we start by taking a look at the honour-loving regime Timocracy, or Timarchy? followed by oligarchy. After that, we can turn to democracy, and fourthly, we can turn to the city which is ruled by a tyrant, and look at that. Will that be a way of trying to become competent judges of the question we have asked ourselves? It would certainly be a logical way of going about our observations and judgments. Very well. Let's try and describe the way in which timocracy might arise out of aristocracy. Is it a general rule that the cause of change in any regime is to be found in the sovereign body itself when civil war arises within this group? That as long as this group, however small it may be, remains united, it is impossible for the regime to be altered? Yes, that's true. In that case, Glaucon, how will the regime of our city be altered. How will civil war break out, either between our auxiliaries and our rulers, or among them? Do you want us, like Homer, to invoke the muses to tell us how first dissension fell upon them? Shall we imagine that they speak to us in high-flown, tragic tones, as if they were playing with little children, and teasing them by pretending to be speaking seriously? What would they say? Something like this. It is no easy matter for a city founded in this way to be altered, but since destruction awaits everything that has come to be, even a foundation of this kind will not survive for the whole of time. It will fall apart, and this will be the manner of its falling. Both for plants in the ground and for animals above the ground, it is a fact that souls and bodies are produced or not produced when the cycles of begetting for each species complete their revolutions. Short revolutions for short-lived species and the opposite for long-lived species. In the case of your species, wise though the people you have educated as leaders of the city are, still they will not quite hit the mark when they apply calculation, together with observation, to their programme of breeding and birth control. Success will elude them, and they will sometimes produce children they should not produce. When your guardians make injudicious unions of brides and grooms, 
The children will not have the right nature, and they will not be fortunate. The previous generation will select the best of them, but they will not deserve selection. And when they in their turn inherit the powers of their fathers, the first thing they will neglect as guardians will be us, the muses, since they will put too low a value on musical and literary education. And the second thing they will neglect will be physical education. The result will be a younger generation which has even less regard for us. And from their number, rulers will be appointed who completely lack a guardian's ability to discriminate between Hesiod's classes or the classes in your city, gold, silver, bronze, and iron. When iron is compounded with silver and bronze with gold, then you will get unlikeness and discordant inequality. And when you get those, wherever they occur, they always breed war and hostility. This is sedition's noble line, we have to say, always, and wherever it arises. What else do the muses have to say? When civil war breaks out, the classes or natures are divided into two. The iron and bronze draw the state towards commerce and the possession of land and housing of gold and silver. The other pair, by contrast, the gold and silver, lead the state towards virtue and traditional order. In fighting and struggling against one another, they arrive at a compromise. The land and housing is to be divided up and owned privately, and they agree to enslave those who were previously watched over by them as free men, friends and providers. They now hold them as serfs and slaves, while their role is to watch them and conduct warfare. Yes, he said, I think that is the origin of this sort of change. In which case, I said, would this regime be a kind of halfway house between aristocracy and oligarchy? It certainly would. Very well. Will the points it has in common with the original regime be these? Respect for the rulers, the disqualification of the warrior element in the state from agriculture, manual employment or any other kind of business? the establishment of communal living quarters, and the concentration on physical education and training for war. Yes, whereas feared of putting the wise into positions of power, since the wise men it has are now complex, not simple and direct anymore, a leaning towards people who are spirited, more straightforward and naturally cut out for war rather than peace, the value it places on military deceptions and stratagems, the way it spends its entire time at war, will most of these characteristics be peculiar to itself? Yes. Now that they possess their own treasuries and strong rooms where they can put their gold and silver and keep it hidden, people like this will be avaricious, like the members of an oligarchy, with a fierce and secret passion for gold and silver. And to protect it all, they will have walls around their houses, real private nests where they can spend a fortune on women or anyone else they fancy. Very true, he said. The value they put on money and their inability to acquire it openly will make them mean with their own money, while their desires and the secret pleasures they enjoy will make them extravagant with other people's. They will run away from the law like children running away from their father, since their education will not have been a matter of conviction but something imposed on them by force. This, in turn, is the result of neglecting the true muse, the muse of argument and philosophy, and setting a higher value on physical education than on education in the arts. It's certainly a mixed regime you are describing, partly bad and partly good. Yes, it is a mixture, I said, but it has one striking characteristic which comes from the dominance of the spirited element, love of victory and honour. Absolutely. So much for this regime, then. That's how it would have come into existence, and that's what it would be like. It's just an outline sketch of the regime without filling in the details, but even a sketch will give us a good enough picture of the completely just man and the completely unjust man. It's an impossibly long task to describe every regime and every character without leaving anything out. Quite right, he said. I imagine the next regime would be oligarchy, 
the regime based on property qualifications, where the rich rule and the poor man is excluded from power. Do we have to explain how the change from timarchy to oligarchy first takes place? Yes. The regime we described is destroyed by the strong room full of gold which each man possesses. They start by inventing extravagances for themselves, and this leads them to bend the laws, since neither they nor their wives are prepared to obey them. That's likely enough. The next step, I suppose, will have been for them to start eyeing one another and competing with one another, and in this way they would reduce the whole population to their own level. Very likely. After that, presumably, they would become still further involved in making money and the higher the value they put on that, the lower the value they would put on virtue. Isn't virtue always at odds with wealth in this way, as if they were in the two scales of a balance, always trying to move in opposite directions? Exactly, he said. And as wealth and the wealthy are more valued in a city, so goodness and the good are valued less. Obviously. What is valued at any particular time becomes the common practice. What is not valued is neglected. Yes. Eventually, then, they stop being competitive and ambitious and become mercenary and money-loving. They praise and admire the rich man and admit him to positions of power. The poor man they treat with contempt. Absolutely. At that point, they pass a law defining the oligarchic regime. They establish a wealth qualification, larger in an extreme oligarchy, smaller in a more moderate oligarchy, and declare that anyone whose property does not reach the prescribed value is debarred from the government. Either they put this into effect by force of arms, or else they've already established this kind of regime earlier by intimidation. Isn't that how it's done? It is. So that, more or less, is how it becomes established. Yes, he said, but what are the characteristics of this regime and what are the kind of faults we said it possessed? Well, I said, the first fault is this very thing which defines its nature. Think what it would be like if you appointed ship's captains in this way on the basis of a property qualification and refused a command to a poor man, even if he was better qualified. I think it would be a sorry voyage they'd find themselves making, he said. And the same with any position of command over anything? That's certainly my opinion. With the exception of a city? Or including a city? It is especially true of a city, he said, since the responsibility a city brings is the greatest and the most demanding. This would be one great failing, then, possessed by oligarchy. It looks like it. What about its second failing? Is that any less serious? What would it be, this second failing? That a city of this kind is bound to be two cities, not one. A city of the poor and a city of the rich, living in the same place but constantly scheming against one another. That is, God knows, as big a failing as the first. You must ask yourself, however, if this city isn't also the first to introduce an evil which is greater than either of these. What evil is that? There is nothing to stop one person selling all his property and a second person acquiring it. Nothing to stop the first person still living in the city after selling his property without being one of the elements which make up the city. He is neither businessman nor skilled worker, neither cavalryman nor infantryman, just a poor man, what they call a man without means. Yes, he said. This city is the first to introduce this evil. Certainly, in cities with oligarchic regimes, this kind of thing is not prohibited in any way. If it were, you wouldn't get one group of people who were very rich and the rest living in complete poverty. That's right. And here's another point to think about. At the point where someone like this was rich and spending all his money, was he even at that time any use to the city for the purposes we've been talking about? Or was it an illusion, his being one of the rulers? Was he, in truth, neither a ruler nor a servant of the city, but merely a spendthrift? Yes, he said, it was an illusion. He was nothing more than a spendthrift. 
Do you want us to say then that just as a drone born in a cell is a blight on the hive, so a man like this is born as a drone in a household and as a blight on the city? By all means, Socrates. Well then, Adamantus, is it the case that God has made the winged variety of drone all stingless, whereas of these two-legged drones, some are stingless, but others have very nasty stings? Do those who finish up as beggars in their old age come from the stingless class, and all those who are labelled criminals come from the class with stings? Yes, that's true, he said. It's obvious, then, that anywhere in a city you see beggars, there you can expect to find a secret nest of thieves, pickpockets, robbers of temples, and all these sorts of malefactors. Yes, that's obvious. And don't you find beggars in cities with oligarchic regimes? Yes, practically the whole population apart from the rulers. Can we avoid the conclusion, then, that in these cities there is a large number of criminals with stings, and that the authorities systematically and forcibly keep them under control? No, we can't, he said. And can we not say that the cause of people like this coming into existence there is lack of education, together with poor upbringing and constitutional arrangements? Yes, we can. Well, that's roughly what the oligarchic city would be like, and those are the evils it would contain, plus some others besides, perhaps. Yes, that's about it. Then that's another regime we can regard as dealt with, the one known as oligarchic, whose rulers are chosen on the basis of a property qualification. Well, the first thing to remember, I said, is that we have reached this point in the course of an inquiry into the nature of justice and injustice. Fair enough. What follows from that? Only this. If we do discover what sort of thing justice is, are we then going to decide that the just man must be in no way different from justice itself, but in every way like justice? Or will we be content if he comes as close to it as possible, and has a larger measure of it than anyone else? We shall be content with that, he said. So, when we asked what sort of thing justice was by itself, and looked for the perfectly just man if he existed, and asked what he would be like if he did exist, what we were looking for was a model. The same with injustice and the unjust man. We wanted to look at the perfectly just and unjust man, see how we thought they were placed in respect of happiness and its opposite, and be compelled to agree, for ourselves as well, that whoever came closest to those examples would have a share of happiness which came closest to theirs. It wasn't our aim to demonstrate that these things were possible. True enough. Suppose a painter paints a picture which is a model of the outstandingly beautiful man, Suppose he renders every detail of his painting perfectly, but is unable to show that it is possible for such a man to exist. Do you think that makes him any the worse a painter? Good heavens, no. Then what about us? Aren't we in the same position? Can't we claim to have been constructing a theoretical model of a good city? We certainly can. And is it possible for anything to be put into practice exactly as it is described? Or is it natural for practice to have less hold on truth than theory has? I don't care what some people may think. What about you? Do you agree or not? I agree, he said. Then don't keep trying to compel me to demonstrate that the sort of thing we have described in a theoretical way can also be fully realised in practice. If we turn out to be capable of finding how a city can be run in a way pretty close to what we have described, then you can say that we have discovered how what you are asking for can be put into practice. Or won't you be satisfied with that? I know I would. 
so would I. In that case, what we have to do is try to discover and point out what the failings are in cities nowadays which stop them being run in this way, and what is the minimum change which could help a city arrive at political arrangements of this kind. Ideally, a single change. Failing that, too, and failing that, as few as possible in number and as small as possible in impact. Absolutely, he said. All right, then. There is one change which I think would allow us to show that things could be different. It is not a small change, or an easy one, but it is possible. What is it? We've been using the analogy of waves. Well, now I'm coming to the largest wave, but I'll make my suggestion anyway, even if it is literally the laughter of the waves which is going to engulf me in ridicule and humiliation. Listen carefully to what I'm about to say. Tell me. There is no end to suffering, Glaucon, for our cities, and none, I suspect, for the human race, unless either philosophers become kings in our cities, or the people who are now called kings and rulers become, in the truest and most complete sense of the word, philosophers. Unless there is this amalgamation of political power and philosophy, with all those people whose inclination is to pursue one or other exclusively being forcibly prevented from doing so. Otherwise, there is not the remotest chance of the political arrangements we have described coming about, to the extent that they can, or seeing the light of day. This is the claim which I was so hesitant about putting forward, because I could see what an extremely startling claim it would be. It is hard for people to see that this is the only route to happiness for a city in its arrangements for the private or public life of its inhabitants. My own personal view is that there is no reason to regard either or both of these events as impossible. If they were impossible, we would quite rightly be a laughing stock, since our proposals would just be wishful thinking. Isn't that so? It is. Now, will anyone challenge our contention that it is possible for the sons of kings and rulers actually to be born with philosophical natures? No, he said. No one in the world would challenge that. And if they are born with philosophical natures, can anyone claim they are certain to be corrupted? Even we admit that it is difficult for them to survive. But is anyone going to contend that in the whole of time, out of all those who are born, not one is ever going to survive? How could they? But it only needs there to be one, surely, with a city which is obedient to him, to bring about all the things which are now regarded as impossible. Yes, one is enough, he said. After all, if a ruler establishes the laws and way of life we have described, it is presumably not impossible that the citizens will be prepared to follow them. Not in the least impossible. Is it astonishing or impossible that the arrangements which seem a good idea to us should seem a good idea to other people as well? Well, I don't think so. That they are the best arrangements assuming they are possible, has been satisfactorily shown by our earlier discussion, I think. Yes, it has. So the position we seem to have reached on law-giving is this. Our arrangements are the best, if only they could be put into effect. And while it is difficult for them to be put into effect, it is not impossible. Yes, he said, that is the position we've reached. Well then, since that topic has struggled to a conclusion... We'd better go on to deal with the ones which remain. These saviours of our city, what will prepare them for their task? What course of study and way of life? And when should each age group tackle each subject? Yes, uh, we'd better deal with that. You'll realise there probably won't be very many of them. The elements of the nature we have described and which we say they must possess are seldom likely to be combined in the same individual. In most people, this kind of nature is fragmented. How do you mean? 
Well, you're aware that those who have a love of learning, a good memory, intelligence, quickness of wit, and everything which follows from those qualities, and who at the same time are developing energy and greatness of spirit, are unlikely to become the kind of people who are naturally inclined to lead an orderly, sober, and steadfast life. Quickness of wit carries people all over the place, and steadfastness goes out of the window. True, he said. Steadfast characters, by contrast, slow to change, the sort of people you can much more depend on, who in time of war are immovable in the face of danger, are likewise steadfast and slow to change even when it comes to learning. They are immovable and unteachable as if they'd been drugged. They are full of sleep and yawns whenever they have to work hard at something of this sort. Yes, that's true. But we said our guardians must be liberally endowed with both sets of qualities. Otherwise, they are not to be given the fullest education, respect, or power. Quite right, too. In which case, don't you think the philosophical character will be a rare one? Of course it will. It must be tested in the hardships, fears, and pleasures we were talking about a little earlier. What's more, we can now add something we omitted then, which is that we must exercise it in many branches of study to see if it will be capable of enduring the most demanding ones, or if it's an intellectual coward, the way some people are physical cowards. Yes, he said, it's a good idea to find that out. But what are these most demanding studies of yours? You may remember us distinguishing three qualities of the soul with a view to drawing conclusions about justice, self-discipline, courage and wisdom, and what each of these things was. If I didn't remember that, I would deserve to miss the rest of this discussion. Can you remember what came just before that? No. What? What we said, I believe, was that we could either get the best possible view of them, but only after a long detour, at the end of which they would be clearly revealed, or we could give an explanation on a level with the discussion so far. You said that was good enough, and as a result, what was said then fell short of complete accuracy, in my opinion, though whether it was good enough for your purposes is for you to say. As far as I'm concerned, he said, you gave us good measure, and the same goes for the others, I think. In matters like these, my friend, a measure which in any way at all falls short of what really is, is no measure at all. What is incomplete can never be the measure of anything, though for some people there are times when they are satisfied with that and feel they don't have to look any further. Yes, there are plenty of people who feel like that. It's laziness. Well, I said, it's not a feeling we want a guardian of our city and laws to have. Fair enough. In which case, my friend, our guardian must go round by the longer road. He must work as hard at studying as he does at physical training. Otherwise, as we've just been saying, he will never see the most important and appropriate subject of study through to the end. I thought we'd dealt with the most important subject. Is there some subject even more important than justice and the things we've been describing? Yes, I said. There is something more important. Also, with these virtues themselves, we shouldn't be looking at a mere outline of them the way we are now. What we want is their realisation in every detail. We must not neglect that. Isn't it absurd to make every effort and do everything we can to reach the greatest possible precision and clarity over things of little significance and then decide that the most important things deserve less than total precision? Utterly absurd. But this thing you call most important and its subject matter, whatever you say that is, do you imagine anyone will let you go without asking you what it is? Of course I don't. Why don't you ask me? You've heard the answer often enough before, and now you've either forgotten it, or else this is another plan to make my life difficult by not letting me get away with anything. It must be the second reason, I think. You've often heard me say that the most important branch of study is the form or character of the good. That which just things and anything else must make use of if they are to be useful and beneficial. You must know that's what I'm going to say now, and you must also know that it's not something we can have adequate knowledge of. But if we don't know it, then however much we know about everything else, without that, as you are well aware, 
it'll be no more good to us than to possess something without the good. Do you think it's any use to us to own all there is and yet not own anything good? Or to be wise in everything but the good, but have no wisdom about what is beautiful and good? Good heavens, no, I certainly don't. Another thing you're well aware of is that while most people think the good is pleasure, those with more sophistication think it is knowledge. Of course. And further, my friend, that those who hold this view are unable to show what knowledge it is. They are compelled, in the end, to say that it is knowledge of the good. A pretty absurd definition, he said. How can it fail to be absurd? They criticise us for not knowing what the good is, and then immediately assume we do know what it is. They say the good is knowledge of the good, as if we're bound to understand what they're talking about, as soon as they so much as utter the word good. <laughs> Absolutely true. What about those who define the good as pleasure? Are they any less wide of the mark than the others? Aren't they in their turn compelled to admit that there are bad pleasures? very much so. Hence, I imagine, they find themselves admitting that the same things are good and bad, don't they? Of course. Is it clear, then, that it is a subject on which there are many serious disagreements? Yes, it is. And isn't something else clear? With justice or beauty, lots of people might settle for the appearance of them. Even if things aren't really just or beautiful, they might choose to do possess or think them anyway. When it comes to things which are good, on the other hand, no one has ever yet been satisfied with the appearance. They want things that really are good. They all treat the appearance of it with contempt. Yes, that's very clear too, he said. This is what every soul follows. All its actions are directed at this. It has a sort of divine intuition that the good is something but it is in doubt, unable to get a firm grasp on what it is, or find any firm belief of the kind it has about other things. As a result, it loses whatever benefit it might have got from those other things. Are we to accept that even those best people in the city, to whom we are planning to entrust everything, must remain in the dark about something of this nature and importance? Certainly not. But if it's not known, I said, in what way just and beautiful things are good. And if in particular a guardian does not know this, what kind of guardian will justice and beauty have got for themselves then? One who is not much of an asset to them, in my opinion, and I have an intuition that no one will have a satisfactory knowledge of justice and beauty without knowing this first. A sound enough intuition. Well then, will we get the best arrangements for our society if the guardian supervising it is the kind of person who does know these things. We're bound to. In that case, let me remind you about things which were said earlier in the discussion and which have been said on many occasions in the past. What things might they be? We say there are many beautiful things and many good things, and the same with everything else. That is how we classify them in speaking of them. Yes, we do say that. We also say there is a beautiful itself and a good itself, and the same with all the things we then said were many. Applying the procedure in reverse, we relate them to a single form or character of each, since we believe it is single, and call it what each is. That is so. The many things, we say, can be seen but not thought whereas the forms or characters of things can be thought but not seen. Exactly. Very well. Which of our faculties do we use to see the things we see? Our sight, he said, and our hearing for the things we hear, and our other senses for everything we perceive? Of course. Have you ever noticed, I asked, how much more extravagantly the creator of the senses has made the power of seeing and being seen than the other senses? No, I haven't. Look at it this way. For hearing to hear and sound to be heard, 
do they need some other class of thing as well? Without this third thing, will hearing fail to hear and sound fail to be heard? No, they don't need any other class of thing, he said. I suspect that many other faculties, I won't say all of them, have no need for any further thing of this sort. Can you think of any? No, I can't. How about the faculty of sight and the thing which is seen? Has it ever struck you that those do need something of this sort? How do you mean? If there is sight in the eyes and its possessor is trying to make use of it, you surely realise that even in the presence of colour, Sight will see nothing, and the colours will remain unseen unless one further thing joins them, a third sort of thing which exists for precisely this purpose. What thing do you mean? The thing you call light. True, he said. In that case, because it involves a third thing of this important character, the link between the faculty of sight and the ability to be seen is something more valuable than the links between the other faculties and their objects. Unless, of course, light has no value. Well, it certainly does have a value. Which of the heavenly gods, then, do you take to be the agent responsible for this? Whose is the light which best enables our faculty of sight to see, and the things which are seen to be seen? The one you or anyone else would take to be responsible, he said, the one you're asking about is obviously the sun. Now, do you agree with me about the natural relationship of sight to this god? What are you saying about it? Sight is not the sun, neither sight itself nor the place in which it occurs and which we call the eye. No, it isn't. But of all the organs of perception, I would say, the eye is the most sun-like, much the most. So the power which it has, the ability to see, it receives from the sun as a kind of grant from an overflowing treasury. Exactly. So too, the sun is not sight, but it is the cause of sight, and it can be seen by sight. That is so, he said. This is what you must take me to mean by the child of the good, which the good produces as its own analogue. In the world of thought, the good stands in just the same relation to thinking and the things which can be thought as the sun in the world of sight stands to seeing and the things which can be seen. What do you mean, he said? Please explain that a bit further. You know that when the eyes stop being directed at objects whose colours are in daylight and turn to those whose colours are lit by the lights of the night, they are dimmed and become virtually blind, as if there were no clear sight in them. They certainly do. Whereas, when they are directed at things whose colours have the light of the sun shining on them, they see distinctly. The same eyes now manifestly do have sight in them. Of course. You can look at the soul in the same way. When it focuses where truth and that which is shine forth, then it understands and knows what it sees and does appear to possess intelligence. But when it focuses on what is mingled with darkness, on what comes into being and is destroyed, then it resorts to opinion and is dimmed, as if its opinions swing first one way and then another. Now, by contrast, it resembles something with no understanding. None at all. You can say that this thing which gives the things which are known their truth, and from which the knower draws his ability to know, is the form or character of the good. Because it is the cause of knowledge and truth, think of it by all means as something known, but you will be right to regard it as different from, and still more beautiful than, knowledge and truth. Beautiful though both of these are. Just as in our example it is correct to think of light and vision as sun-like, but incorrect to think that they are the sun, in the same way here it is correct to think of knowledge and truth as good-like, but incorrect to think that either of them is the good. The good is something to be prized even more highly. It's an incredible beauty you're talking about, he said. 
if it is the cause of knowledge and truth, but itself surpasses them in beauty. And you of all people, presumably, are not going to say that it is pleasure. <laughs> Be silent, I said. Don't even mention the word no. Take a closer look at our comparison. How do you want me to look at it? The sun gives to what is seen, I think you would say, not only its ability to be seen, but also birth, growth and sustenance, though it is not itself birth or generation. Of course it isn't. For the things which are known say not only that their being known comes from the good, but also that they get their existence and their being from it as well though the good is not being, but something far surpassing being in rank and power. Ye gods! Glaucon exclaimed, making us all laugh. What a miraculous transcendence! Don't blame me, I said. You were the one who compelled me to tell you what I thought about the subject. I was, and whatever you do, don't stop now. If nothing else, at least go through your comparison with the sun to make sure you haven't left anything out. I've left all sorts of things out, I said. Well, don't. Don't omit even the smallest detail. I'm sure I shall omit something, quite a lot, probably. All the same, as far as is possible, on an occasion like this, I won't leave anything out on purpose. No, don't, he said. Very well. You must be aware, as we said, that there are these two things. One of them is ruler of the category and realm of what can be understood. The other is ruler of what can be seen, of the heavenly scene, I could say, only I don't want you to think I'm playing with words. Anyway, be that as it may, you accept that there are these two forms of things, the seen and the understood. Yes, I do. Imagine taking a line which has been divided into two unequal sections, and dividing each section, the one representing the category of the seen, and the one representing the category of the understood, again in the same proportion. The clearness or obscurity of the sections of the line relative to one another you will find to be as follows. In the category of the seen, the first section is images, by which I mean in the first place shadows, and in the second place reflections in water, or any dense, smooth, shiny surface. Everything of that sort, if you see what I mean. Yes, I do. The second section you must regard as what the first section is an image of. The animals we see every day, the entire plant world, and the whole class of human artefacts. Very well, I so regard it. Now, looking at our division in terms of truth, and its opposite, would you be prepared to say that the distinction between the likeness and the thing it is a likeness of is equivalent to the distinction between the object of opinion and the object of knowledge? Yes, I would, he said, most emphatically. Ask yourself next how the section which represents the understood should be divided. How should it be? Like this. In the first part, the soul treats as images the things which in the other section of the line were originals. It is compelled to work from assumptions, proceeding to an end point, rather than back to an origin or first principle. In the second part, by contrast, it goes from an assumption to an origin or first principle, which is free from assumptions. It does not use the images which the first part uses, but makes its way in the investigation using forms alone, through themselves alone. I don't entirely follow what you just said. Let's try again. You'll find it easier when you've heard what I have to say by way of introduction. You're aware, I imagine, that when people are doing things like geometry and arithmetic, there are some things they take for granted in their respective disciplines odd and even, figures, and the three types of angle, that sort of thing. Taking these as known, they make them into assumptions. They see no need to justify them either to themselves or to anyone else. They regard them as plain to anyone. Starting from these, they then go through the rest of their argument and finally reach, by agreed steps, 
that which they set out to investigate. Yes, I am aware of that, he said. And you will also be aware that they summon up the assistance of visible forms and refer their discussion to them, although they are not thinking about these, but about the things these are images of. So their reasoning has in view the square itself and the diagonal itself, not the diagonal they have drawn. And the same with other examples. The models they construct, or figures they draw, which have their own shadows and images in water, these they treat in their turn as images in their attempt to see the corresponding things themselves, which can be seen only by thought. True. That is why I described this category as grasped by the understanding, but as requiring for its investigation that the soul make use of assumptions. The soul cannot make any progress towards a first principle since it is unable to escape from these assumptions and move in an upwards direction. Instead, it treats as images the things which were treated as originals and copied by what was in the section below them and which are thought of as clear by comparison with those images and valued for their clarity. I see, he said. You mean the realm of geometry and its related disciplines? Finally, by the other section of the line representing the objects of understanding, you must take me to mean what reason itself grasps by its power to conduct a rational discussion, when it uses assumptions not as first principles, but as true bases, points to take off from, entry points, until it gets to what is free from assumptions and arrives at the origin or first principle of everything. This it seizes hold of, then turns round and follows the things which follow from this first principle, and so makes its way down to an end point. It makes no use at all of any object of the senses, but only of pure forms, working through them and towards them, and it ends in forms. I sort of see, he said, though not as well as I'd like. I think what you're talking about is an enormous task, but I do at least understand that you want to take that which is and is understood and distinguish that part of it which is studied by the knowledge which comes from rational discussion as something clearer than the part which is studied by what are called the sciences. These use assumptions as first principles, and although those who study them are compelled to use thinking rather than their senses to do so, still, because their investigation does not make its way upwards to a first principle but proceeds from assumptions, you do not regard them as having an intelligent understanding of their subjects, although with a first principle they could be understood. I also think that when people are doing subjects like geometry, you call their state of mind thought rather than understanding, because you regard thought as a halfway house between opinion and understanding. You've grasped my meaning well enough, I said, and please understand that there are four conditions arising in the soul, corresponding to the four sections of the line. Understanding corresponds to the highest section, thought to the second, belief to the third, and conjecture to the last. Classify them accordingly, believing that the degree of clarity they possess is proportional to the truth possessed by their objects. I understand, I agree, and I classify them in the way you suggest.